All right. But <laughs> this uh, lecture is really on and the ones that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start off talking about management of arrhythmias. Uh, I'll talk about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, primarily a disease of cats. Valvular disease leading to heart failure, mostly mitral valve, primarily a cause of heart failure in small breed dogs. Dilated cardiomyopathy, a major cause of heart failure in large breed dogs. Systemic hypertension, often seen in renal failure patients. Pulmonary hypertension, often seen in chronic respiratory disease. Then, of course, cardiac arrest and uh, hypotension which occurs in a variety of situations, as does thromboembolic disease. Now, I'm not going to talk about heartworm disease. It's not thromboembolic in the usual sense of the word, meaning a blood clot. You do have um, em embolism from the dead and dying worms, but that's a different story, so I'm not going to go into that. But we're going to talk off, uh, start off talking about arrhythmias, and broadly speaking, we divide them into bradyarrhythmias and tachyarrhythmias. Uh, bradyarrhythmias mean an abnormally slow heart rate. All right, <laughs> so here we see a second degree AV block. <laughs> now, first degree, you remember, is a long PR interval. And <laughs> probably that exists here, I hadn't measured it. But this is second degree because you've got P waves without QRS uh, complexes following. You'll see the, <laughs> this uh, in itself and also a problem called six sinus syndrome where uh, conduction through the sinoatrial node does not occur. We will try to manage these medically uh, <clears throat> and we'll do so by giving a test dose of atropine and if the heart rate picks up, then we may use an oral parasympatholytic called propantholine. So it, it acts basically identical to atropine, but it's um, oral. You have to give really large doses of atropine orally for it to have an effect, though there are some toxins that do that. Mostly, though, this is going to require pacemaker surgery. Most of these are not really that responsive. Uh, but we do this, it's a rare, but we do um, put pacemakers in. Um, <coughs> so most of our arrhythmias, though, are tachyarrhythmias, high heart rate, all right? And um, the antiarrhythmics that we use can be divided into four classes. You have class one, which is sodium channel blockage, and then subtypes A, B, and C. These reduce the phase zero slope. That's the initial depolarization, okay? So it, it in essence, slows down depolarization. Um, all of these work primarily by that mechanism, so they're less prone to propagate abnormal rhythms. <coughs> Class twos are beta blockers. Here we're talking about uh, beta one blocker. Uh, a class three is a potassium channel blocker and a four is a calcium channel blocker, okay? <clears throat> now, of the tachyarrhythmias, we divide them further. They're supraventricular, meaning the atria <clears throat> and typically uh, SA node is sometimes included, or they're ventricular, all right? Here's an example of a supraventricular tachycardia uh, this is actually called a paroxysmal atrial tachycardia. So you've still got the SA node uh, controlling things, <clears throat> but it's firing rapidly. So this is about uh, uh, tachycardia, atrial tachycardia here. There's a P wave for every QRS. <clears throat> this uh, then slows down. That's what the paroxysmal means. It's bursts followed by normal activity. All right. Now, why is this a problem? Uh, it's a problem because when you reach a certain high heart rate, you're not allowing enough time for a proper filling of the ventricles. You know, <laughs> systole is where you push the blood out. Diastole is where the blood flows back into the ventricles. You're not allowing enough time during diastole for proper filling. So uh, heart rates we shoot for in large dogs is pretty well accepted. 
we want a heart rate less than 160. It's much less defined for small dogs and cats. That's a, a general guide. Cats particularly can run unusually high and still do fairly well. Uh, so you have to judge those based on clinical sign. How do we slow these down? Uh, if it's supraventricular, if it's atrial, probably the, uh, the, one of the best are the beta blockers, okay? So it's a class two, and we prefer the selective beta ones. The initial drugs that came out were uh, non-selective. They blocked beta one and beta two. We typically don't want to block beta two. They're the bronchodilators, this sort of thing. So we prefer selective uh, beta ones. Now one issue in heart failure and in, in the atrial tachycardias occur with or without heart failure. It's not unique to just heart failure. <clears throat> but they do have an, uh, a negative inotrope. You know, inotrope is force of contraction. Inotropy is force of contraction. Chronotropy is rate of, uh, of um, is heart rate, all right? So we want the negative chronotropy, but we have to realize we do have some negative inotropy to contend with. <clears throat> now, curiously, uh, if you give low dose beta blockers in humans, beta one blockers, they actually have a beneficial effect in uh, heart failure in humans. They don't understand why <clears throat> the hypothesis is that the, uh, with heart failure, you get a chronic overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. The heart's not pumping properly, so the sympathetic nervous system kicks in, vasoconstricts, releases epinephrine, releases norepinephrine, trying to uh, increase the cardiac output by rate and by increasing preload. And the hypothesis is that this chronic stimulation leads to downregulation of the beta-1 receptors in the heart so they no longer are functioning properly. And giving a low-dose beta blocker will allow that to return toward a normal regulatory state. Uh, this is one of the few drugs that has consistently improved uh, outcome in human heart failure, low-dose beta blockers. Having said that, we rarely use them in veterinary medicine There's, uh, for that purpose. Uh, <coughs> there is uh, the internal medicine cardiology specialty uh, addressed some of these things, and they could not come up with a consensus as to whether they should be used or not. So that part remains controversial. But nevertheless, if you have a uh, atrial tachycardia, your beta-1 blockers are probably one of the best ones to use, okay? And by the, one, the way, the most common beta-1 blocker is a tenolol. Uh, it allows us to use that once a day, which is very convenient and has really very few side effects. It has a very large uh, therapeutic index. All right, another drug that slows the heart rate and we will use in these scenarios sometimes are the calcium channel blockers. Again, a negative chronotropic effect. They're the class four group. Now they're more commonly employed in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I'll talk about the pathophysiology of that and why uh, they're a good one there. But regardless, they do slow the heart rate uh, and they're added commonly. Again, heart failure, you have to be a little cautious because, again, of the negative inotropic effects. So we usually don't use um, a calcium channel blocker uh, unless we're confident the ejection fraction is okay, meaning they're not in systolic failure, or if they are, are having systolic failure issues, they're already on an inotrope like pimabenin or digoxin. The primary um, drug there is diltiazem, comes as an injectable and it's an oral. And one of the things about the calcium channel blockers, they have different predilections on whether they work on the heart versus the vessels. Uh, there's some uh, calcium channel blockers, I'll mention amlodipine later, relative to hypertension. It has most of its effects on the vessels causing vasodilation 
with relatively few effects on the heart. There's a, another calcium channel blocker we don't use very much called verapamil that has nearly all its effects on the heart and very little on the vessels. Diltiazem lies in the middle. It has effects both on heart rate and on vasodilation, and enhancing vasodilation. Okay. <clears throat> now, atrial tac can start off with the SA node, but sometimes that tissue is damaged. One of the things that occurs in many heart failures is you get a dilation and a stretching of the atria. And so you lose the SA node as the triggering. Normally the SA node, you know, is the thing that triggers the initial um, QRS complex that then travels through the atria down the AV node to the ventricles. Okay. And <clears throat> the worst case scenario of that going astray is atrial fibrillation. And you can see that there's no P wave before each of these QRSs. And actually, if you look at it closely, this is really squiggly. And what's happening is the atria are just sitting there quivering. So it's not a, con uh, a coordinated contraction. That's called atrial fib. All right. And uh, because it's constantly depolarizing, the AV node is being hit again and again and again with an impulse carry down to the ventricles. So high heart rates tend to be a common problem with atrial fib. <clears throat> now there are certain ways that you can address that. Uh, in human medicine, if it's idiopathic, then they will do electrical defibrillation. You know, just like they do on an emergency room with ventricular fibrillation, where they convert it from V-fib back to a rhythm, you can do the same thing with the atria, okay? And I don't know if you remember uh, President Bush won, but uh, he had atrial fib and, and actually his vice president, Dan Quayle, was president for about 30 minutes while they put him under to do uh, defibrillation. Uh, and I won't make any comments beyond that. Okay. Uh, um, we can convert them medically, possibly. Uh, quinidine is an antiarrhythmic, it's a 1A that's been used in the past, but it's really prone to a lot of side effects and it displaces digoxin, which makes them more prone to a digitoxicity. So you don't see quinidine used very often. Uh, it's largely been re uh, replaced by amiodarone, which is a class 3, and it works both on ventricular and supraventricular. Uh, but it has a high incidence of side effects, especially hepatotoxicity in dogs. So <clears throat> we're a little reluctant. Now, do, dogs do have an idiopathic atrial fibrillation. And if I wanted to convert it, I would try the amiodarone. That would be my drug of choice. And monitoring very closely uh, for side effects, including hepatotoxicity. But if it's not idiopathic atrial fib, then it's secondary to heart disease. And the problem with trying to convert an AFib if they have heart disease, uh, their myocardium is damaged, is they nearly always revert back to atrial fib. So you can convert them with amiodarone or quinidine, but they don't stay converted typically. They relapse back. And that's where digoxin plays a role. And we'll talk to you about dig more in um, heart failure aspects. But one of the things it does is it slows conduction at the AV node. It doesn't do anything to stop the atrial fib. That's still occurring. But it keeps um, <clears throat> the AV node where fewer of the impulses are conducted. So it slows heart rate by that manner. And that's a very beneficial thing. So you'll see a lot of uh, animals that have atrial fib. We don't try to convert them because of underlying myocardial injury. Instead, we'll put them on digoxin to slow the heart rate. And sometimes we'll add other, we'll add diltiazem or beta blocker if the dig is not enough. Okay. <clears throat> now, atrial or supraventricular tachycardia is not good, but we really, really get concerned about ventricular tachycardias, ventricular tachyarrhythmias. There, 
the atria are no longer controlling uh, the um, QRS complex. You've got a foci in the ventricle that is instead firing. Okay. Now, <clears throat> part of the reason that's bad, normally remember in your normal conduction, the AV node carries the impulse down to the tip of the heart and then it spreads upward. So it contracts from base uh, upward or from apex to base. Anyway, from the tip up toward the atria to go out the aorta or pulmonary vein. So it's a nice coordinated contraction. When the impulse is occurring in the middle of the myocardium, you don't get that coordination of a good contractile uh, push. So that's uh, not a good thing. Now here are some of the PVCs, premature ventricular contractions. You'll also so see that referred to as VPCs, ventricular premature contractions. They're the same thing. Uh, you have a unifocal, okay, where this is your normal QRS, and here we've got uh, a, a PVC occurring, and then some more QRSs. Notice that these look the same. When the PVCs are identical, that's a unifocal. That means you have one area of the heart that keeps firing, one area of the ventricle that keeps firing. Uh, what concerns me a little more is when we have multifocal. Here we see one PVC and here is another, and they don't look the same. Okay, that means you've got more than one site in the ventricle that's irritated and is firing, and that bothers me a little more. Okay. Another one that is of concern is uh, the R on T phenomena. Okay. This is when a PVC is occurring right on top of a repolarizing T wave. Okay. So <laughs> it's um, discharging right when the rest of the heart is repolarizing. And it sets up the stage uh, for ventricular fibrillation really easy. So R's on T's are uh, one of the things we prefer not to see. Now, they can go from PVCs to just continuous PVCs. That's VTAC, okay, typically unifocal. So here you have an area of the ventricle just firing over and over again. All right, that's scary when you see it. Uh, we don't always intervene. I'll talk to you about when we do intervene with antiarrhythmics for ventricular arrhythmias. But the concern is this one down here, ventricular fibrillation. And that's when you've lost all coordination. The myocardium of the ventricle is just sitting there uh, wiggling, and it's not uh, able to coordinate a contraction. Therefore, the blood pressure drops, and they will die shortly thereafter. Uh, it's a type of um, cardiac arrest. Asystole is more common, where the heart just stops altogether. But B fib is your other type. Uh, of cardiac arrest. All right, now, so I just said we don't routinely treat. All right, why not? We used to, at one time, we saw a couple of PVCs, we were reaching for um, an antiarrhythmic. We now know that <coughs> we sometimes cause more problems than we cure by giving an antiarrhythmic. Oddly enough, Nearly all of your antiarrhythmic drugs are arrhythmogenic. They can cause arrhythmias in and of themselves. So if we don't need it, we don't use it. Things we're looking for, we see the PVCs here, here, but we look, are there pulse deficits? Is there hypertension? Is there weakness? When we see these sorts of things in addition to the uh, PVCs, then we intervene. And again, I get more concerned when I'm seeing multifocal PVCs and R on Ts. Then I'm much more likely to intervene also. Okay. Now I want you to, to make a note of differentiating a PVC from an escape beat. Okay, escape beats are when you've got a third degree heart block. So nothing is making it down from the atria through the AV node. And the ventricles are saying, wow, I need to keep my patient, my being, my body alive. So finally, a part of the ventricle triggers and fires and creates a, a ventricular contraction. All right. 
This is a compensatory mechanism to keep the animal alive. Okay. <laughs> Never give an antiarrhythmic to a third degree heart block because if you abolish the ventricle's ability to fire, you have just killed that animal. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, one of the tip-offs, escape beats, are always uh, Brady arrhythmias, slow heart rates. Okay. <clears throat> it is a ventricular contraction. It doesn't look normal, but it's going to be a slow heart rate, typically, with a lot of P waves not connected to anything. So you need to differentiate escape beats from PVCs. So what do we use when we do need to intervene? Easily, easily the drug of choice is lidocaine if they're hospitalized, okay? It's a uh, 1B antiarrhythmic. You just have to know that it's a class one, affects the sodium channels. <clears throat> and it is our antiarrhythmic of choice. Now, it has very low bioavailability. If you tried to give lidocaine orally, uh, you'd numb their tongue and their mouth, but that would be all. The liver wipes it out on a first pass effect. So it has to be given uh, IV, typically as an initial bolus, followed by a constant rate infusion. Okay, <clears throat> so that's our drug of choice. Some clinicians don't like to use it in cats. They consider cats more sensitive to lidocaine toxicity. I'm not sure that the evidence bears that out. If you actually look at the toxicity data, it's pretty well the same dose across species. They all tend to uh, have problems at about the same uh, dose or concentration. Uh, I consider nearly all of them, my maximum non-toxic dose to be about 10 mg per kg as a single dose of lidocaine. My hypothesis on why this may be in the literature, and I'll admit it's just a hypothesis, not a theory, but that is that we get so used to using large volumes of lidocaine to do nerve blocks that we forget how little it is that a cat or a small dog can handle. At 10 mg per kg and your typical eight pounds, say four kg uh, cat, that's 40 milligrams. And you all ought to know by now that 2% lidocaine has 20 milligrams per mil in it. That's two cc's is all it can have before you're, you've approached the maximum non-toxic dose. So I'm not sure that the cat is truly more sensitive. It may just be an artifact of uh, carelessness on our part, but you will see that stated. Now, <clears throat> that works if they're in the hospital and you can give it IV. Now, the, the uh, procainamide and the mexilatine are also class uh, one drugs, and we'll use them either when we need to go non-IV, i.e. outpatient, or they're not responding to lidocaine. Typically, if they're not responding to lidocaine, one of the things I'll try next is procainamide, okay? Uh, and make sure their electrolytes are uh, okay. Hypokalemic or hypomagnesic animals uh, don't respond very well to these. Now, those are um, the type one drugs. Sometimes, if they don't respond, we'll instead go to Sotolol, which is a class three. Now, Sotolol is kind of unique it's classified as a class three, but it also is classified as a class two. It's a combination beta blocker and class uh, three drug. One drug, but it does two things. And it's good for both supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias, as is amiodarone, which is also a class three. So the class threes can treat both supraventricular and ventricular more commonly, we're using them for ventricular arrhythmias, though, where lidocaine or procainamide has failed. Sotolol, particularly, is very good to send home. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> just so you'll know, 
Uh, these are two that are used in human medicine a lot that we don't use in veterinary medicine. The canonide was going to be the oral lidocaine. Unfortunately, it turned out to cause um, corneal injuries in dogs, so we don't use that. And phenytoin is a very common antiarrhythmic in humans, but it's got a really short half-life in the dog and probably toxic in the cat, so we don't use it. In human medicine, it's really good at antagonizing uh, digitalis-induced arrhythmias, but most clinics, veterinary clinics, don't stock it because we just never use it. Uh, <clears throat> so those don't 